West Asia, a key strategic region in the world, is in tumult. And it's all kinds of tumult, some of which is even positive. Over the past month, we've heard all kinds of discussions talking place. The Saudis and the Iranians are talking, the Saudis and the Houthis in Yemen are talking, Syria, Russia, Iran, Turkey, all of these players, many of whom have had very difficult relationships in the past, are talking or are going to talk soon. And all of this actually raises a lot of questions. Is the face of West Asia going to change? Is some of the violence that has become so endemic to the region going to end maybe? At the same time, we also have Palestine where these answers seem way more clearer. The Israelis are continuing their brutal assault on Palestinians, whether it be in the city of Old Jerusalem, whether it be in the rest of the West Bank, whether it be in Gaza, blockades, all kinds of attacks, arrests, continuing the violence from 2022. We'll be looking at the larger West Asian region in this special show by People's Dispatch. So, Prabir, a lot on our menu today and no surprise because so much has been happening in West Asia over the past few months. Very difficult to keep up. Of course, we have some, some of the more, you know, usual, unfortunately usual cycles of violence like in Palestine. But we shall, we shall talk about it. More interesting has been the fact that uh, there has been some signs of rapprochement of traditional rivals. We have talked about the Saudi Arabia-Iran discussions that are taking place. But to, I think, maybe center the discussion first, let's maybe first move to what uh, Yemen, which is really, uh, you know, the latest news is that there has been a prisoner exchange agreement. I believe some 900 prisoners, the Saudis are released to the Houthis. There are likely to be more prisoner exchange arrangements in the next few weeks. So we're looking at something that we thought was very difficult, which is like an eight-year conflict suddenly, you know, maybe moving towards a solution. So what prompted Saudi Arabia, which was really bombarding uh, Yemen like anything, to really come to the table? Let's go back to the earlier map that you showed us. The, here, the interesting part of it, the battle which was really we are talking about is over Yemen. Of course, Saudi Arabia had attacked the Houthis in Yemen because the Houthis had taken over from those forces who are aligned or very close to Saudi Arabia. And Saudi Arabia wanted this area to be under their control or influence. This is also important because if you see this particular seaway, uh -huh. and that's important because this finally connects to the Mediterranean. Mediterranean to the Ara Arabian Sea, the Indian Ocean, whatever you want to call it. Therefore, Yemen has a very strategic position in it, and particularly Aden, which has been an ancient harbor, a trading port of enormous significance in the world. And in this attack on Yemen, we had, of course, the United Arab Emirates joining it. Right. So this is not that it was a simply a Saudi Arabia. It was a joint United Arab Emirates uh, Saudi forces which attacked the Houthis, who opposed the, uh, I will not call it puppet, but Saudi Arabia's allies in Yemen and carved out a position for them, themselves, at least in Northern Aden, right. uh, Northern Yemen. So this was the battle which was going on. It's a much more complex uh, picture of, of Yemen, which we won't, won't get into. But Houthis have a history of being good fighters. So they not only were successful in beating back the, uh, the Saudi Arabian forces and the Emirati forces, they were also attacking the Saudi Arabian Aramco facilities, right. even the airport, all of this was proving a huge thorn on the Saudi side. That too with very little equipment, the drones basically. Well, yes, drones and missiles. Mm -hmm. You see, Yemenis are not that technologically uh, backward as people might think. They have had their own air force, the ability to manufacture at least low-end missiles and low-end drones, which of course, they would have probably got technological help from Iran, which is what everybody says. But a lot of it is also the fact the Yemenis are people who have the skills to do a whole right. lot of things. With help and support, they can do it. So therefore, these attacks which are taking place in Saudi Arabia, particularly Aramco, meant that if Houthis could not be defeated, then it will remain as a permanent thorn in Saudi side, particularly the Aramco facilities. So here was the issue that it is not simply a question between Saudi Arabia and Yemen. Iran is also into the mix for very obvious reasons. Right. And of course, United Arab Emirates, even the Houthis have attacked the uh, Emirates, again, air, airport and so on. 
So they all decided the time has come to stop this war. Mm -hmm. Now, this is something the world has been asking for quite some time. Yemen has been hugely harmed. The population have faced enormous deprivation. We have had, you know, diseases come up, which we cholera haven't epidemic, seen. For cholera instance. epidemic, for example, come up, which we haven't seen. No clean drinking water. Right. The schools, etc., are all shut. Mm -hmm. What happens to children? Malnutrition. Whole range of things. And Yemen has a very rich history. Right. If you remember the, the, the kind of cities that were there in medieval Yemen, which are really eight-storied and so on. These have been things which are engineering terms in front lines of the world right. in terms of technology <clears throat> and other things. See, Yemen has a huge culture. Mm -hmm. So has Yemen in terms of trade. It's not some, just a backwater. Right. So therefore, Saudis attempt to subdue it, having failed. The question is, how do they come together? So let's go back to the map that you had started with. This is the Yemen map. Let's start with this area. Mm -hmm. This is probably some of the what are called the jihadist forces, very right, right wing, with tacit support of Saudi Arabia, which are there. Then there is the Aden, the southern part of this area, which centered on Aden, which seems to have been backed by United Arab Emirates with certain forces, which have uh, seems to be holding that area. Then we have Sana and the Houthis really right. occupying this area. And that's where the battle has been with Saudi Arabia. This oh. is where they have been Marib bombarding. Specifically, huh? Pardon? Marib specifically. Marib is a town over there yeah. on which battle is going on. But they have been attacking with drones and other things, the Saudi Arabian forces. They have attacked physically inside Saudi Arabia over here. So this is something which bothers the region. Oh. So it's not just between Yemen and Saudi Arabia. Iran is obviously involved because we know that Yemenis have been supported by Iran, at least with knowledge, technological help, probably even some arms and uh, ammunition. And Oman is a rich country which does not want war on its borders. Right. So Oman has been a peacemaker, not only in the, this case, Yemen and Saudi Arabia, both seem to be meeting in Oman, but also Oman has been a peacemaker between Saudis and the Iranians. Right. So, in fact, a major initiative over here was taken with Oman in the loop, also Iraq in the loop. Soleimani was coming to discuss some of these issues in Iraq when he was killed. So, this has been the larger dynamics of the region. And it seems now United Arab Emirates is also a part of the peace process. But the discussions in Oman, it seems, with the what you talked about, prisoner exchange, all of these issues. It seems this is, this is a harbinger of peace in the Yemen war, but also peace breaking out, which is very, very problematic for the United States. Peace breaking out in the region in which the larger set of forces, essentially Saudis, United Arab Emirates, Qatar, and Iran, all of them, including, of course, the Syrian battlefield, all of them willing to look at solutions within the region, right. not going to countries outside mm -hmm. to mediate for their Absolutely. peace. Right. If you go back to the map that you had shown before, that the larger issue is that we have peace breaking out between Iran and Saudi Arabia. And also, it seems to now involve Syria. Right. And Syria means peace not only between Iran and Saudi Arabia, but also Turkey is Turkey, involved because Turkey has been very much a player in this area. So how can these forces come together on the Syrian issue? And it seems now Saudi Arabia and Iran, Syria are talking about readmitting Absolutely. Syria back into right. the Arab League of Nations. And therefore, they were thrown out because when the... Uh, various struggles broke out against Assad, the question of who, who was behind the struggle, we will not get into at this stage. There's no question that Turkey backed the struggle in a big way, intervened in Syria, the United States intervened in Syria. So you had all kinds of forces who were active in Syria. 
Now it seems they are also willing to come to the table and work out their own disengagement. Right. Now that for the United States is a huge change that it is no longer the country to go to in order to negotiate right. or intercede on behalf of one or the other. It ceases to the king be the kingmaker, king yeah. which it was in this right. area. I think one of the experts had said that uh, the important thing is not that uh, you know, who is involved but who is not involved, which is exactly. the United States. That who is not involved is the United States. Right. You see, this is an area, if you go back to President Carter, he had declared this entire area as a strategic area for the United States because oil is a strategic asset of the United States. Therefore, this was supposed to be a part of United States strategic assets and therefore they could go to war right. against any country which interfered with that. Absolutely. Now that of course doesn't take into account the fact that these countries are independent. Right. So they have the right to take their own decisions and of course at that time Iran was the basic issue because as you know their uh, puppet Shah of Iran had been overthrown and of course uh, President Carter was humiliated with the embassy and holding of the embassy personnel hostage, which is what Iranian street government forces right. who took over from Shah of Iran did at that time. So that was the what he was smarting under. But the net result of saying this is our backwaters, nobody can enter that, was of course a huge slap to all the countries over there. And it's taken about 40 years before now, slowly the pendulum has swung back that we will decide our own future right. and not it will not be decided by any other country. So next in line would be then Turkey and Syria. Absolutely. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned uh, Syria, Prabir, because a lot of lot happening in Syria as well. We know that the Saudi foreign minister might uh, go to Syria soon. There's going to be an invitation for Syria to join uh, the Arab League. Saudi Arabia also working much more closely with Turkey after years of very bad relations following the Khashoggi incident. Also interesting because last year we did see Turkey make a lot of noises about continuing its military operations, especially in these regions. But keeping all this in mind, you know, do we see sort of do we see Syria sort of uh, developing into? You know, how do we see the situation developing considering that Syria is still really split up into pieces and the United States, like this map shows the blue areas represent the US allies of various forces working under their direction, under their control, still has a very substantial presence in Syria. Uh, this is an interesting issue because nobody has invited US forces into Syria. Syrian government has not. Even the Islamist forces, supposedly the enemies of the United States in their uh, global war on terror, they have not. Who invited them? So they seem to have invited themselves and they still hold, if we take this area as well as this area into account, which is the where the US forces still hold the territory, this is about 30% of Syria's territory. Now this is a really a desert and so is this, not very thickly populated, but it has oil in this part of the area and a lot of oil goes by the uh, Kurdish areas which really are here and they go into really Iraqi held Kurdish territories. From there they go into Turkey and this is a uh, how, uh, if you remember President Trump had said, well the oil will pay for our occupation and he had said Syria we are leaving but we'll still control the oil well. So that still happens even if uh, Biden has become the president, that hasn't stopped. You still see oil going out of uh, Syria and that is a part of the US occupation. Now this occupation is being done in connivance with or in conjunction with forces which had aligned earlier with the Islamist forces which now have broken free of that and have gone under US uh, right. umbrella. Al-Tanaf is again another area. Again, nobody's invited them there. There is, it also is the connection between Damascus over here mm -hmm. and Syria. 
and Baghdad, in fact. So this is right there to stop that connection. Of course, there are other connections also between uh, Syria and Iraq. But that was the original route which has been stopped. Al-Tanaf is sitting over there, again, providing some umbrella to Islamist forces. And of course, Turkey is in these areas, as you know. And they are, in fact, saying that we will not let the Kurdish forces gain control of the area. Kurdish forces are here, they are here, and the Kurdish forces at the moment are trying to be in between the United States and Syria. It's a difficult position right. for them because their main enemy is really Turkey, who also want to take this entire area away because they feel that Kurdish entities in Turkey are people who are being supported from here, the same entities, and therefore they feel that it's a PKK, which is the Kurdish entity in Turkey, that they are the ones who are really over here, rather than indigenous Kurdish right. people of Syrian origin. So this is a complicated picture. But again, why is US here? Because as we have said right in the beginning, nobody's invited US in. So this is where Turkey, Syria, Iraq, are three forces who should be sitting down and discussing how to bring peace to the area. And in fact, Syria today, the Syrian government does not control these parts of the of, of Syrian territory. Large portion of the populated regions are under the Syrian government. Right. So I think Turkey, who has been in negotiations with Syria under Russian ages, they have been having Astana talks a number of times these discussions have taken place. Slowly that process, hopefully, will make it possible to bring uh, peace in Syria, right. between Turkey and Syria. But the question is, what happens to the US forces over here? Will they let go that easily? Or fighting against them? Is that even feasible for Syria to fight against the United States? These are the questions. Or will it be that if the whole region unites and said, we will talk about peace and bring peace ourselves, then the US will be forced to vacate this area, is a question that we have to see how it goes in the future. Mm -hmm. But the real issue what you have raised, raised is yes, Turkey and Syria are willing to talk. And if what we have seen happens between Saudis and Iran, then I think between Syria and Turkey also, the possibility of right. peace is there. This is a huge threat to the right. United States, exactly. because if peace breaks out in the region, and the U.S. threat is the people will be able to bring about what they want, how they want their future to be without the tutelage or the intervention right. of the United States, right. which means the strategic resources of this area will no longer be under their tacit control. Absolutely. Right. Just to sort of also clarify for the audience, we have multiple dynamics here, like I said, Saudi Arabia and Turkey talking on the one hand, Saudi Arabia and Syria talking on the one hand. We know that Syria and Iran are very close, Hezbollah is involved, Saudi Arabia and Iran talking. So, like you said, all these dynamics, while in parallel, nonetheless seem to indicate, you know, a kind of convergence, which does look possible. But uh, if there's something that is kind of sticking out in this region, unfortunately, and where people are really suffering, it's maybe the last area we need to talk about, which is Palestine. And, uh, you know, it's, it's one of those conflicts we've talked about often on our channel, and uh, b which seems to be escalating by the year. So let's maybe go to Palestine and see what's really happening right now. So Prabir, of course, the latest news, or at least the news over the past few weeks, is the month of uh, the you know the month of Ramadan going on. And as usual, as has happened in 2022 and 2021, there have been continuous attacks on Palestinians. Al-Aqsa Mosque in uh, occupied East Jerusalem, of course, being the center of a lot of these attacks. Attacks by both Israeli security forces, attacks by uh, say Jew illegal Jewish settlers, of course, trying to claim that space trying to, you know, although it's against the laws. And of course, also the continuing violence over the past few months. We know that 2022 was the most, uh, you know, most violent uh, year from since 2005. Huge number of people, especially attacks in the West Bank over here, some very important cities continuously being attacked like Janine. But, uh, uh, you know, the question has also been, the interesting thing has been that Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu and the far-right government also facing protests inside, you know, by one section of Israelis. So, it's a huge amount of chaos at this point of time and violence against the Palestinians. So, so maybe let's first go to uh, the East Jerusalem issue. 
and Alexa and why this continues to be such a, a point of conflict or oppression, to be honest. So, to get back a little to what you were saying earlier, that old Jerusalem city mm. is only about two square kilometers, right. is a small part of the existing Jerusalem city. Mm. And over there, if you take the old Jerusalem, which is what we are seeing, the two square kilometers in which the Al-Aqsa complex is situated, it had what are called Jewish quarters, Armenian quarters, Christian quarters and Muslim quarters. It was split in four sections right. and the, each of the sections operated in peace with each other. And so there was a peace between all communities for a very long time. It's not there have been historical struggles which have continued and it's only now broken, is continuing or has broken out again. So this is of course something which is important to all three Abrahamic religions, the Jewish, the Christians and the Muslims, partly because if you remember that this is where supposedly the first two temples were. Now the second temple, which is the, the last one that existed, was destroyed by the Romans. Islam had nothing to do with it. So it was really the Romans who destroyed it. And therefore, this association of the third temple with the Al-Aqsa complex is something that the Jewish settler population, particularly the extreme writing variety of it, says or whips up every time saying we need to build the temple here. The temple has to be built here only because this is where the old temple was again the Solomon's first temple and the second temple which was demolished by the, by the Romans. No, we do not know where they were or historically are there remnants of this over there, but that doesn't really matter. You know, when mythology takes over history, right. it has a dimension of its own. So the settler population or the, what you call the really the right wing settler population has been trying every year to desecrate the complex. So that's really what they do. They try and do and therefore attacks on the complex particularly at the time. This is also unfortunately both the Jewish religion and the uh, Islamic uh, religion both observe the lunar calendar. So the Passover and the Ramadan uh, basically take place almost together and therefore the religious tempo heightens in this period. So every time the call of the Al-Aqsa mosque is preserve our sanctity by putting people inside the, uh, the, the basically this is the dome of rock over there which is where Muhammad is supposed to have ascended uh, and this is the, the mosque. So man the mosque. So the people stay there at night. So continuous attacks by right-wing forces but also Israeli uh, armed forces, police, whatever attacked the people inside the complex for a number of days. Finally, the last three days of Ramadan, they allowed the peaceful, peaceful, uh, uh, at least celebrations to take place. There were no attacks after there was really a huge outcry in the world on this. Pictures came, photographs, um, videos, all of this showed the kind of settler police security forces violence that took place in the complex. So this is something which is recurring. But in this particular case, it also had the tacit support of Netanyahu, right. who is facing a huge inner struggle among the Jewish community. It is not that it is the basic, the old Palestinian population who have been disenfranchised over a period of time, who officially are Arab Israelis. But nevertheless, they don't really get a whole lot of things in terms of uh, what their rights are. So it is not they were protesting this time. Netanyahu's protests came from what would be called the secular Jewish population who identify themselves as Jews, who identify this as their land, but are not, do not identify themselves as wanting to be completely sectarian or going back to the position which are there amongst the certain settler population that all the Arab population has to be thrown out of this land. This is exclusively ours. Nobody else can stay here except Jewish population. So this throwing out business is what is where finally the line is drawn. Disenfranchising them in various ways is still okay. But throwing them out, they know 
would put them outside the pale of civilized nations. And therefore, they have been saying, no, this is not okay. That division, which was manifested in Netanyahu's attempt to pass a judicial reform, judicial reform which would have meant they could, he could have nullified the conviction which he already has for right. corruption. So the uh, parliament could say he is not guilty and then the court would have to accept that. And also a whole bunch of uh, religious laws could be passed, which would effectively make the non-Jewish population, particularly the Arab population, who, who are both Christians and Muslims, right. disenfranchise them completely. That is what was the battle which is going on. And in this, when Netanyahu aligned with the extreme right, because he needed to be the prime minister, otherwise he was going to go to jail. The conviction would have stood. So that issue there has been to some extent papered over by this struggle. And perhaps that is the reason why this struggle assumes this force, because then it papered over the struggle internal to the Israeli state, which is a huge number of even reservists, right. the army, hmm. air force reservists, are not willing to come and serve. And if they don't serve, half of Israel's army doesn't exist, right. because his reservists are the ones who count for at least 50% of the armed forces in Israel, and they are not permanent armed forces. So all of this meant that either he had to come to a reapproachment with his own people, or he had to whip up an external issue. And I guess Al-Aqsa Mosque is always an easy uh, right. incendiary issue, mm -hmm. which brings the Jewish population in one place. What also what happens after the Al-Aqsa Mosque issue coming up, that Israel actually attack parts of Lebanon, parts of Syria, and of course, always Gaza is a focal point of attack. So attacks took place in these three areas. So again, it heats up the area, it creates a war uh, atmosphere, and of course, the reserve forces then, reservists, who were earlier protesting, and because Netanyahu withdrew partially from his judicial reforms, he's got one month time to settle this issue, that they went back to the army and air force. And therefore, the bombings, which is a regular right. Israeli uh, activity, they, they took place. All of it happens when the Al-Aqsa Mosque is attacked. Right. All of these things also are companion, uh, so to say, in what happens. Absolutely. So they, there is protest from here. A few rockets are launched, and of course, in Israel, the launches attacks on this area. Right. They are clear. They are also careful not to attack Lebanon too deep, because Hezbollah has proven right. itself to be a strong force. Right. So therefore, they're a little more uh, wary about that. They also are finding it difficult to enter Gaza at will oh. and uh, conduct military operations. So the operation seems to be more rocket fire, and within limits, so that there is no a really large reaction to what they're doing because Lebanon, also Hezbollah has a lot of rockets. Syria has not attacked Israel as yet, though in Julan Heights, there's still conflict going on. Syria claims Julan Heights is theirs because that is what was taken over in the 68 war. Yeah. So that is very much something that Syria uh, feels should go back to it. And of course, there are attacks, therefore, on Syrian forces also by Israel. So these, every time Al-Aqsa Mosque issue comes up, these also heat up. So if there is a larger peace that breaks out in the area, then what happens to Israel's politics, what happens to Palestine is not a minor issue right. because one of the safety that Israel had is our enemies are divided, they are fighting against each other. Jordan is not going to go with them. Oh. Only Syria is a problem. Uh, Hezbollah is a problem. Uh, Iraq is no longer such a big problem. So this is something we can handle. But Iran supporting Syria and Lebanon is only one issue. Peace breaking out between all these areas. If you take the Abraham Accords, which is the basis of Israel thinking, it could get a certain number of Arab states with it, Islamic states, if you will, with it, and therefore will be able to break out of its isolation. That doesn't seem to be happening. If you remember the Abraham Accords included Bahrain, 
It included United Arab Emirates. It included also and later Morocco and Sudan as well. <clears throat> Morocco and Sudan as well. Yes. The big yeah. discussion was whether Saudi Arabia would be would come into it, but they held out. They were trying very hard to get Saudi Arabia into it, and unfortunately, without Saudi Arabia, this piece is incomplete yeah. because Saudi Arabia was seen to be a staunch U.S. ally, yeah. and therefore. Railroading or arm twisting Saudis to join the Abraham Accords is a big play. If that succeeded, then Saudis are, after all, the protectors of the Makkah, the Medina, yeah. the holy sites of Islam. Therefore, they would have it would have thought it could be thought that their stamp would make Israel legitimate in the region. That did not happen. Saudis did not do that, and now with Saudis making up with Iran, that whole Abraham Accord seemed to have disappeared into thin air. Right. So that importance of the same Abraham Accords seems to be no longer there. I think that's the other big thing that has taken place in the region, that we have a different dynamic taking place. And what we see is a larger peace breaking out. This would involve Turkey, it would involve Syria, Saudi Arabia, Iran, and of course, United Arab Emirates also, who have been a big player in right. all of this. So Yemen, is only a part of the issue. But Syria and Yemen are the sites of the struggle. But the real struggle is between the larger players in the region. And that is where the US hold is slipping. And they are negotiating among themselves. And they are willing to accept Russian as a more independent and you know impartial negotiator between, say, Turkey and Syria, and China between Saudi Arabia and Iran. Yeah. I think that is a really a huge stray, a huge change in the overall scenario right. for this region. And I think that is something which the US is not able to understand or stomach mm -hmm. because they never expected something like this to happen. They seem to have been taken aback right. by the, uh, shall we say, the speed at which the events have Not happened. to mention that Saudi Arabia, UAE are among the countries which as part of OPEC Plus have agreed to once again cut their oil production and that's not making the U.S. happy. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Prabir, for talking to us and giving us an idea. Like you said, uh, the threat of peace is really what the United States fears at this point. Although I think for people in the rest of the world, this could be a really good thing. Of course, the key issue, like you said, remains Palestine. How long will this circle of violence against the Palestinians continue is a very important issue. But thank you so much and we'll come back to some of these topics in future episodes as well. So there you have it, uh, the question of peace, very, very important on the minds of all of us at a time when there's so much war, conflict, so many global challenges. If there could be some measure of peace, some measure of stability in West Asia, we would see millions of people benefiting, especially the people in Yemen who suffered one of the worst humanitarian crises of this century. We'll be tracking some of these developments in the coming months and weeks as well. Until then, keep watching People's Dispatch.